Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Make sure to vote in the poll for the character next month, and like and subscribe to stay young forever. Maybe. Today we're building the immortal leader of the Lost Boys, Peter Pan. Created by J.M. Barry in 1902, Peter Pan has been adapted countless times in countless mediums. We'll be adding one more today and creating the rascal in Dungeons & Dragons. I'm gonna We'll start off with our goals for the build. First, we need to live forever, or close to it. Surprisingly, that's actually not too difficult in Dungeons & Dragons. Next, we need a pixie friend who can make us and our friends fly. Finally, we'll prepare ourselves to do battle with pirates and buckle swashes, whatever that means. For stats, we're using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll if you want, just make sure you hit those multi-classing minimums. Dexterity is going to be number one here. Fencing with pirates requires quick feet. Charisma next, Peter isn't nearly as successful without his fairy companion. Wisdom will follow. Peter lives alone in the woods with children. He must have some survival skills. After that, constitution. It will help keep us in the air longer. Strength is on the lower end, but you don't really need it, and we'll dump intelligence. Peter may celebrate living without parents, but it's not the best way to learn about the world. We can hit one of our goals early by rolling up a wood elf. They live for up to 750 years and stay young for the first hundred. You also get plus two to dexterity and plus one wisdom, 60 feet of dark vision, keen senses for the perception skill, and advantage on saves from being charmed or frightened from fey ancestry. You also get the benefits of a long rest with only four hours of rest from trance and 35 base movement from your fleet of foot. Finally, you can hide when lightly obscured in foliage, rain, snow, or mist with the Mask of the Wild, which will pair well with some future abilities. For background, take Folk Hero. It gives you survival and animal handling skills. Level 1 will go for Rogue. You'll get four skills of your choice. Take Acrobatic, Sleight of Hand, Stealth, and Persuasion. You get expertise in two skills of your choice. Persuasion is good for leading bloodlusting orphans, and Stealth will help you get your Sneak Attack bonus. Speaking of that, your Sneak Attack lets you add 1d6 to damage you do with finesse and ranged weapons when you have advantage on the attack, or if there's an ally within 5 feet of the creature you're attacking. Over to Warlock now, they're a wonderful class that kind of lets you build two characters instead of one. Our second character will be the Archfey known as Tinkerbell, and she'll give you the Fey Presence to use once per day. This lets you force a Wisdom save of 8, plus your Charisma modifier, plus your Proficiency bonus on creatures in a 10-foot cube. If they fail, they're either charmed or frightened for one turn, you can do this once per long rest. You can also cast two cantrips, Friends gives you advantage on Charisma checks with one creature that isn't hostile to you for up to a minute if you maintain concentration. When the spell ends, the creature knows you used magic and will become hostile. Blade Ward gives you resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, reducing that by half. Takes an action to cast, but could be useful if you know you'll be taking a hit. Finally, Warlocks are a casting class, so check out Charm Person, which charms a creature within 30 feet of you that fails a wisdom save. Lasts for up to an hour, and they have advantage on the save if you're fighting them. Expeditious Retreat lets you dash as a bonus action for up to 10 minutes if you maintain concentration. You also have two spells from the Archfey that don't count against your known spells. Fairy Fire creates a 20-foot cube that forces a deck save on creatures inside. Failing that, creatures have advantage on attacking them and they can't become invisible. You also have Sleep, which puts things to sleep. The amount of HP you can put to sleep is equal to 5d8. Roll that and start with the lowest health enemy, then move upward. Level 2 of Warlock, you gain two Eldritch Invocations that give you special powers. Thief of the Five Fates lets you cast Bane once per long rest using a Warlock spell slot. It forces a Charisma save on three creatures, failing that they subtract 1d4 from attack rolls and saving throws, helping you get advantage on a whole crew of pirates. Armor of Shadows lets you cast a Mage Armor on yourself at will. That makes your AC 13 plus your Dex modifier. Think of this like your shadow moving about on its own, distracting the enemy. Level 3 Warlocks pick a boon from their Pact. Pact of the Chain lets you cast Find Familiar as a Ritual, and you have extended options that include a Sprite, which can attack because this is a special Find Familiar. Its stats are in the back of the player's handbook, I won't get into them now, but it's much better than your other options. Since it is a Familiar, it can also cast touch range spells like Spider Climb. That's a second level spell that lets a creature walk up walls and hang from ceilings with its speed equal to their regular movement. At the fourth level of Warlock, you can rally the Lost Boys with the Inspiring Leader feat. We just used this last week on Star-Lord as well. You can give up to six creatures temporary hit points equal to your Charisma modifier plus your character level after a 10 minute speech. If your DM insists on 10 minutes of talking, just shout like a crow until they give up. Fifth level Warlocks can learn third level spells, and now Tinkerbell can make people fly. It's a touch range spell, so your familiar can cast it, and it gives creature flying speed of 60 feet. You also get another Invocation. Gift of the Everlasting Ones is aptly named, while your familiar is within 100 feet of you, you automatically heal the maximum amount. You don't have any healing spells yourself, but someone in your party does, hopefully. Pack to Rogue now, second level gives you a cunning action, letting you dash, disengage, or hide as a bonus action. This pairs really well with the flying speed, letting you dive in and out of combat at will. 
Third level rogues can take a martial archetype. The swashbuckler from Xanathar's Guide to Everything is the perfect fit. You get fancy footwork, which means that when you've made a melee attack on a creature, they can't make opportunity attacks against you for the rest of the turn. You also have rakish audacity, which means you can add your charisma modifier to initiative rolls, in addition to your dex modifier. You can also make a sneak attack against a creature when there is no other creatures within five feet of you and you don't have disadvantage. That sneak attack damage is also now 2d6. This might be a good place to end the build off, but we can keep going to maximize the synergy of the warlock swashbuckler. Fourth level rogues get an ability score improvement, bump up your dexterity, it should be close to capping by now. Fifth level rogues get uncanny dodge, letting you reduce damage by up to half as a reaction as long as you can see your attacker. Your sneak attack damage also bumps up to 3d6. Sixth level rogues get expertise with two more skills. Sleight of hand and acrobatics are great for your hit and run sensibilities. Seventh level rogues get evasion, meaning you take half damage on failed deck saves and no damage on successful ones. Good for anyone regularly flying away from cannon fire. You also now have 4d6 for your sneak attack damage. And Eighth level rogues get an ability score improvement, cap off your dexterity, and start investing in your charisma for more inspiring speeches, better initiative rolls, and higher warlock saves. Ninth level swashbucklers get panache, letting you use your action to make a persuasion check against a creature's insight check. If they're hostile to you and you succeed, they have disadvantage on attack rolls against creatures that aren't you for a minute. If they're not hostile, they'll charm for a minute. This ends early if an ally attacks the target or you move more than 60 feet away. Your sneak attack damage also increases to 5d6. 10th level rogues get an ability score improvement. Charisma is almost as important to this build as dex, so give it some love. We're gonna jump over to fighter for two levels here really quick. Level one fighters can choose a fighting style. Duelist adds two to your damage when you're using a one-handed weapon and not holding anything else. This will be good for consistency, though one or two times you can't get your sneak attack bonus. You also get second wind, which lets you heal one d10 plus your fighter level as a bonus action once per long rest. Second level fighters get action surge, giving you one more action once per long rest. 11th level rogues get reliable talent, meaning that you can't roll lower than a 10 for skills in which you are proficient. This is before you add your modifiers and proficiency bonus, so reliable is kind of an understatement here. You're also now dealing 6d6 extra damage with sneak attacks. 12th level rogues get another ability score improvement, and we can almost cap off that charisma modifier. Unless you were lucky with rolls, then you can. Congrats, you lucky codfish. Our capstone is the 13th level of swashbuckler. That means you get elegant maneuverability. This lets you give yourself free advantage on acrobatics and athletic checks with a bonus action, and you get 7d6 sneak attack damage as well. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how good of a build this is. First, flying with cunning actions makes you great for hit and run fighting. You can dive in, deal 7d6, sneak attack, and get out. You're also likely to be first in the initiative with a plus 9 modifier. The first round's usually an important one, and you get to set yourself up wherever you want to be. Part of that comes from your high charisma modifier, which blends really well with warlock spell saves, inspiring leader bonuses, and social skills. As far as weaknesses go, you only have two spell slots. Warlocks aren't exactly known for an abundance of spells. This means that you've got a total of 20 minutes of flying time per day before the pixie dust runs out. If you lose concentration, it could be even less. Your damage is also limited to piercing and slashing. You never got any damage spells from those warlock levels, so things with thicker hides may need to be whittled down slowly. Finally, your health is capping in the 100 range, putting you in danger of that bad boy spell power word kill. Thankfully, degenerate pirates tend not to have high level magic. Fly in, fly out, and rally your crew so the Lost Boys always come out on top. Just try and wrap things up quickly. Eternal life can end prematurely when exposed to too much damage. Thanks for watching. If you like the video, subscribe for more. We make new videos every week. We'll have a special bonus video on Thursday to celebrate Kingdom Hearts 3's release, but I need some feedback for a build next month for characters that will never be in a Kingdom Hearts game. Your options are Princess Mononoke, Howl and his moving castle, or Kiki. Come back next week, we'll be doing one of the finest builds in the world.